Okay, good morning, and, and sorry, we, we were trying to work out some clicker problems up here. Um, we're going to work on energy today, and the way that I'm going to uh, walk you up to that level of the mountain, you know, I always think of, you know, learning is walking up a mountain. And, you know, most mountains, there's more than one way to get up. So we're going to take a little stroll through the idea of coordinates and dimensions in space. And uh, we'll have some homework this weekend. Uh, as you know, hopefully notice here, uh, the uh, SI schedule is um, uh, set up here. I should have done it a couple weeks ago. Anyways, there's SI today at 1.30. Here's a close-up. Uh, till 2.20 p.m. in Engineering 1, Room 383. Tomorrow, 11.30 to 12.20 at VAB, Visual Arts Building 113. Uh, I also set up a page inside web courses in Canvas, uh, so don't feel like you have to copy it down every day. But I'll have that schedule up on the title page of each lecture. Uh, every day, and so you can kind of coordinate. And as I've mentioned before, I'll, I'll mention it again, it's good to uh, get to SI uh, even one time a week. If you can squeeze in half an hour on Thursdays, that'd be good. It'll help you. And what you really want to do is be able to work efficiently with your homework, and especially to work efficiently on exams. And exams it's especially important to work efficiently because I don't write, uh, you know, cinchy exams. You have to really think. To think, you have to read carefully. If you don't read carefully, you're going to make a mistake. Matter of fact, I was in office hours with a student yesterday, uh, and, and we were going over a problem that the student got wrong, and the student says, you know, I just missed that. I didn't read carefully. And... That's why I always say on exams, number one admonition is to read carefully. Another thing I want to uh, review with you just briefly is uh, my office hours are Wednesdays uh, 9 to 11 in Physical Sciences Building. And Caroline Pittman here on the right is also having uh, office hours Friday. So tomorrow she'll be in the Physical Sciences Building. Here's Darian and Caroline together. This is back on the day of our final exam. Whoo, a big pile of exams. Remember that? And, uh, and they're smiling. And I was smiling. By the time I get them all photocopied up, I'm smiling. But the students, of course, are not in the picture. They were not smiling. They were nervous. And you'll be nervous, but hopefully not too nervous on final exam day. Anyways, that's in the atrium of the physics, uh, Physical Sciences Building where Caroline will see you. So, uh, and she does a great job. And I know several of you have gone to see her during office hours, and, and I encourage anybody to do that. Uh, she's very friendly and very smart, and she's very helpful. Uh, another thing, I finally posted the exam one total. It wasn't any mystery, but now it's officially on the books in your grades page uh, above the two separate. So the two constituent scores are exam one Scantron and exam one clicking. They add up to exam one total as shown here. Uh, so, um, so that's good. Any questions about any of that uh, stuff before we continue? Okay, let's continue. Uh, just to remind you, last time we talked about a collision of boxcars, and we modeled it using uh, momentum states. We computed before and after the total momentum, and we used the fact that um, Sir Isaac Newton's second law uh, justifies the concept of conservation, of, uh, second and third law, actually. They both together justify the concept of, of conservation of energy. And that's enunciated uh, or was enunciated in this uh, pair of equations uh, Tuesday. 
that the momentum beforehand, P subscript I, is equal to 154,000 kilogram meters per second. And that's equal to, if conservation of, energy, uh, conservation of momentum holds, 154,000 kilogram meters per second. Before the collision, Abigail, the momentum was only in boxcar number one. After the collision, it was in the entire string of four boxcars. So the, uh, this second equation here, PF equals 154,000 kilogram meters per second, we can write that down because of conservation of momentum as a principle. And using the definition of momentum, we can write down uh, P equals MV. You know, whatever the conserved momentum is, it's always an MV, a mass times a velocity. And in this case, it's the new velocity of the uh, string of four boxcars, for which the mass is 140,000 kilograms. And from that, we were able to figure out uh, V nu. You had a problem like that uh, on the uh, homework, uh, a little extra practice. And we're going to try another collision uh, type interaction now using eye clicker. All right, so get your eye clicker out. And um, what we're going to do is a, an interaction of a molecule and a photon. Now, these are extremely small objects. Uh, a molecule is very, very tiny. The objects that make together a molecule, atoms, are very tiny. The things that make up an atom, protons, neutrons, and electrons, are very tiny. And uh, the, so we're going to do a little bit of uh, extra instruction about um, how to calculate in uh, atomic units. Uh, here's the molecule that we're going to talk about, retinal. And don't try to make a picture of it, but you can look it up on the internet. Uh, retinal is the molecule inside your retina that when it catches a photon of light, either red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, or violet, any, any color photon, it will bend and then relax and then bend, straighten out, and then relax, and straighten out. Every time it gets hit by a photon, it'll bend, it'll straighten out, and then it'll relax back down to its, its uh, low energy state. Uh, and that's in, re in response to a photon of visible light. And this is the molecule inside the retina of your eye, of either eye, that, and you've got zillions of them in there. These are the molecules that fire the optic nerve. And this is how you see. And you see zillions of them, and they're arranged in, in groups. You know, you have cones and you have rods, you know, rod-shaped objects in your retina. But inside all those are little, little retinal molecules, and these are the ones that respond to, to light. And so it's a pretty important molecule. Uh, when, you, when you see something... You know, like you're looking at the computer screen. You can only see that because it's reflecting light. The, the light comes from the projector, hits the screen, and then bounces back towards your eye. If your eye right, is aimed in the right direction, you'll catch photons that come from the, the uh, screen. And those photons will excite the retinal molecule, and it'll fire up your optic nerve, and it'll go into the visual processing center in your brain, and uh, you'll be able to say, oh, that's, uh, that's the letter R, or that's a, a patch of blue, or, you know, whatever it is, whatever set of photons are hitting your eye. Your brain is extremely powerful. Uh, I, you know, I don't care what your SAT score was. If you're in the sound of my voice, if you're in this room, your brain is phenomenally, and was on the day you were born. When you were born, within days, four or five days later, you had the ability, visually, to distinguish your mom's face from every other face in the human race. Unless maybe if your mom has a twin. But other than that, and, and every and that's a, a little baby, four or five days after after they're born. 
they can do that. We can't get computers to do that reliably. And not nearly as fast as a little baby. And that's just when they were a baby. Now you're big, you know, young men and women. And you're all grown up and everything like that. You're even smarter, supposedly, than a little baby. And you can, you know, and every time you catch a basketball and you're playing hoops, or every time you, uh, you're in traffic, can you imagine... Because, you know, we're just starting to get cars to observe traffic and drive and get from point A to point B without crashing. And I don't even, I, I, I wouldn't want to drive in one of those, I wouldn't want to ride around in one of those driverless cars, not yet. I've heard they, some, has ever, anybody in here been in one of those driverless cars? Wherever they are? Have you? Were you scared? That's it. Oh, well, that's pretty nice. I mean, anything that I would trust a car to parallel park. I mean, because nobody gets killed with a parallel parking. But oh, she's wealthy. Oh, I don't know. I'm a little, I'm still a little shaky on that. But anyways, driverless cars, and it's, they're really expensive, right? It's a really expensive car. Yeah, it's crazy expensive. So we, but you guys, no matter what your SAT, no matter how low your SAT, you can drive better than one of these driverless cars. Anyway, so retinal is the, is the thing that encodes vis, visible information and sends it into your brain. All right, now, the atomic mass unit. This, I want to go over this with you just briefly. Um, this is the handy size for measuring mass um, when you're talking atoms and molecules. So instead of using kilograms or grams, which you can certainly do, it's, it's not forbidden, but you're talking very, very small fractions of a gram, very, very small fraction, like 10 to the minus 27th of a kilogram. So it's, it's not really convenient, but the atomic mass unit is, and it's encoded into the periodic table, down here, this little tile of the periodic table for oxygen, you know, the symbol, capital O, that's the chemical symbol, you know, for H2O, for instance. Um, the name oxygen at the top. The number eight, that tells you how many protons in the nucleus. It's the atomic number. And then 15.99, that's the atomic weight. Uh, in the atomic mass system, an AMU is about the mass of a single proton. Now, technically, it's one-twelfth of the mass of nature's most abundant molecule, or atom of carbon. The most abundant atom of carbon in nature is a six and six carbon, six protons, six neutrons. It's called carbon-12. A twelfth of that mass is officially one atomic mass unit, right? So, a pro, so it's basically about equal to a, a proton. So a hydrogen, which is a proton and an electron, is about one AMU in mass. And it's some small, tiny fraction of a kilogram as well, you know, like 1.6 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. But in... in Atomic mass units, it's one. Oxygen, and you can look at it from this table, from this cell of a periodic table. It's got eight protons and eight neutrons, most oxygen in this world. Some oxygen has uh, nine neutrons. Some oxygen has ten neutrons, but most of it in nature is eight and eight. And that's about 16 atomic mass units. Retinal is a little heavier, it's many more atoms, a bunch of carbons, a bunch of hydrogens, and one oxygen. That oxygen is the kicker in retinal. Now, that's the mass of it. So in terms of momentum, if you're, if you're trying to think about momentum, P equals MV momentum, um, and you're traveling, say, for instance, at 1.0 meters per second, well, then hydrogen's momentum, you could write it down this way, 1.00 AMU meter per second. Instead of scientific notationing up, 
you know, with kilogram meters per second, which you could do if you want. It's certainly not forbidden. It would be, if you get those numbers right, you'd get a correct grade on the test, a written test anyways. But for us, you know, it's, you know, if you're, if you're working, you know, for the day with atoms and molecules, this is good. Okay. And here's what, you know, 1.00 AMU meters per second is the same as 1.66054 times 10 to the minus 27 kilogram meters per second. Yuck. You know, so you could definitely do that, but why would you want to? You know, if you have your choice, if you have your druthers, as they say. Oxygen, 16.0 meter, uh, AMU meter per second. If it's tra if, if your oxygen molecules uh, motating along at 1.0 meters per second, this would be its momentum. Uh, retinal, 284 AMU meters per second. Okay, so your clicker question coming up, and it's a collision question, a momentum question. It's going to be in AMU meters per second. Uh, so we're going to work with this one up here uh, for today, for this quest, coming question, uh, in units of AMU meters per second. That'll be a, kilo, uh, that'll be a momentum unit. Um, you know, if you're talking baseballs, humans, bicycles, cars, uh, Trucks, spacecraft, uh, kilogram meter per second is better unit. That's the right size. But if you're talking galaxies, you wouldn't use kilograms. I mean, you could, but, you know. And I think, I'm thinking about doing a, a homework problem for you tonight or over the weekend using uh, momentum states of galaxies. Did you know that the Milky Way galaxy, that's the galaxy th that we live in, and the nearest neighboring spiral galaxy is called the Andromeda Galaxy, and it's designated M31. Um, those two galaxies uh, are interacting with each other. They're kind of orbiting each other, and they have a common center of mass, and they're kind of in orbit around each other. The Andromeda Galaxy is bigger, uh, but Milky Way Galaxy is pretty good. Uh, we wouldn't... Um, we can think about the momentum transfer between the two galaxies through the gravitational interaction because they're getting some delta P, each of them, equal but opposite delta P's. And, uh, you know, you could calculate it. I'll try to do a calculation of that for you, maybe for homework. Anyways, for atoms, we want to do this. And, yeah, we don't need to do this down here, uh, but you can certainly do it. You can do galaxies in those units, too, if you want. All right, here's your question. And I want you, you probably should write it down. Um, a photon delivers a little bit of momentum, delta P 71.0 AMU meters per second of pure momentum to a retinal molecule that's at rest in the retina of your eye. How fast does the retinal move after absorbing the photon? Note, and an important note, the photon itself is massless. Yep, I said that. M equals zero exactly for the photon. It still carries momentum and energy, though. So the retinal acquires some momentum, 71.0 uh, AMU meters per second, but no additional mass. So the mass afterwards is 284, unlike the boxcars. All right. Now, um, go ahead and vote. Try to make a decision. And uh, keep your calculator out. We're going to be using it a little bit. Forty five seconds. So this is like a boxcar problem, except you, the boxcar after the system afterwards doesn't have more mass, but it does have more momentum. But this is physically realistic.
15 seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Ching. All right, go ahead and display that. All right. Um, it looks like there's a little controversy going. That's all right. Let's take a look at the answer. Um, answer is 0 0.250. Here's how we do it. Go ahead and write down. We'll start with delta P. How about that? All right. Delta P is PF minus PI. And hey, you guys, PI is just zero because it starts at rest. All right. That's, that's, that's the cinchy part. All right. Uh, so PF is whatever. So you get a kick of 71.0, delta P of 71.0 AMU meters per second, and it all goes into PF. So PF is 71.0 AMU meters per second. All right. Now, Theoretically, that's also equal to MV of the molecule, all right? So you can write an equal sign to the right of that and then write in MV. There it is. M for the molecule is 284 AMUs. And VF, the final velocity, the initial velocity is zero. The final velocity is whatever it happens to be, 0 0.25 in this case meters per second. Uh, yeah, so there's, so we've got everything in there now. We've got 71.0 AMU meters per second on the left and 284 AMUs times VF on the right. So we can solve for VF. Just divide it up. Divide both sides by 284. Here we go. Uh, VF equals 71.0 AMU meters per second in the numerator, in the denominator. 284 AMUs. And visually, hopefully, uh, mentally, you don't even need a calculator for that. 71 over 284 is 1 over 4. I made it especially simple, but on an exam, I might not. I might make it, you know, some, you know, like 0.17 or 2.4 or something like that. But this one's fairly easy. 0. 250 meters per second. So that's the speed that that this um, retinal molecule acquires. And this is kind of an idealized um, interaction because really what happens, it doesn't just um, acquire speed, it also bends. It'll, it'll, uh, so it's like a car that, you know what it's like? It's like a, an antenna on a car. Raise your hand if your car has an antenna, a radio antenna. Not many. They don't make them that way much anymore. But anyways, an antenna, if you ever notice, antenna, when you're going fast, it kind of curves backwards a little bit. So that's what, that's what happens to, to a retinal. It, it bends a little bit when it gets uh, some extra energy. And it's important to note here as a side note that the photon delivers pure momentum. It has no mass. But it carries energy and momentum, and it can deliver that to the photon, to the, to the molecule or the atom, without uh, changing the mass uh, of either. Now, another thing I want to point out to you here, I spent several minutes talking about AMUs, but guess what? They cancel out. Right there, if you're up there on the second line, AMUs and AMUs cancel left and right. In the third line, the third equation, AMUs cancel top and bottom. So you can cancel them at, at either point. And that tells you something about you know, why momentum are, are useful. Because a lot of times you'll get nice cancellations like that. And... The calculation that we did here, we could just as easily 
um, have done, excuse me, I'm about to, <coughs> excuse me, oh, uh, Uh, we could easily have done that with galaxies. Do you know how we measure the mass of a galaxy? Uh, in solar masses. We don't use grams. We don't use kilograms. We don't use AMUs, although we certainly could. But um, any kind of an astronomical object, like a star or a galaxy, and is measured in how many times the mass of the sun uh, something is. So, you know, for instance, the star uh, Antares that you can see in the early morning, uh, right now, a beautiful red star in the south, part of the Scorpius, Scorpion constellation, Antares, beautiful red star. We can rate the mass of that in, you know, like, I don't know, whatever the mass is, 42 times the mass of the sun. You know, and, and Alpha Centauri, the closest uh, star to us, is like one, it's almost exactly one times I think it's 1.1 times the mass of the sun, very close to us. A galaxy would be hundreds of thousands or even millions of solar mass units. Uh, so it just depends on what kind of physical system you're working with. But if you were working with galaxies, that it would cancel out. So if I do that for homework, you'll have some canceling out to do. All right. Coordinates and dimensions in space-time, or as they say on Doctor Who, Time and relative dimensions in space. Uh, we're, when we set up a coordinate system, I mean, that's one of the first things I talk about in the textbook, it's really so that we can calculate stuff and make accurate diagrams. Accurate diagrams help us understand and think about it. Calculations help us. You know, for instance, we're calculating curvature, a radius of curvature, or, or maybe calculating a distance, you know, between various events, positions, and so forth. Uh, and, and with that, we, we can also calculate um, accelerations if we make some time measurements. Um, and as I mentioned last time, usually we use rectangular or, or rectilinear coordinates, x, y, and z. Uh, but we could be using some other coordinate systems, spherical coordinates, you know, latitude, longitude, and radial distance from the center of the coordinate system. I uh, mentioned that on, th on uh, Tuesday. But uh, one thing that Einstein developed around 1905, about 110, 112 years ago now, um, he said, all right, you've got to use time as more than some kind of handy bookkeeping tool. You know, Sir Isaac Newton said, you know, time is absolute. Everybody agrees on the same time. You know, once you get your clock synchronized, you know, how, you know how they do that in like a World War II movie, you know, all right, let's synchronize our watches, you know, so everybody's operating at the same time scale. You know, once you get your, your, um, your watches and your clocks synchronized, you know, which your computer does for you, you know, then all your, you know, your calendars agree and your, your bus schedules agree and your checkbooks are, you know, orderly and stuff like that. And for Sir Isaac Newton, that was it. You know, and time could be calculated and stuff, but it wasn't, there wasn't anything um, other than that. It was, it was like a bookkeeping device. But Albert Einstein said, no, you have to consider it as a dimension, the fourth dimension. And um, you have to consider our universe, this grand book that Galileo first opened to study, uh, as a space-time. Not just a space, but a space-time. A four-dimensional manifold of space and time. So, and here, this is the kicker, three, uh, 2C. This is, the, this is the bite. This is the grip. This is the thing that I want you to remember. And that is, if time really is another dimension, then we have to treat it that way, as if it were an X or a Y or a Z coordinate, as much as we possibly can. And so um, 
And, and we're not used to doing that. You know, you're not used to thinking about a calendar. I mean, you look at a calendar, it's a grid work. You know, and it's, it's basically a timeline that's folded back on itself four or five times per page. You know, the, whatever month you are, you have four or five lines. And, and it, you know, goes, you know, kind of like a buzzsaw back and forth, back and forth, the way you read a book. But really, it's, it's a dimension that should keep going out um, and, and does keep going out. And I'll make a side note uh, to you concerning the theory of relativity that Einstein... Uh-oh. I just jiggled the display. Come on, baby. All right. Uh, my side note to you uh, is... And this is relative to the kicker, 2C. What Einstein figured out is that you have to treat time in a similar way that you do X, Y, and Z. But there's one difference. You can't treat it completely that way. And the, the most direct view of that, the easiest and simplest view of how time works differently than X, Y, and Z is the Pythagorean theorem. If time really is the fourth dimension, then a temporal extent, a duration, a delta T, ought to go into the Pythagorean theorem, you know, Delta T squared plus delta X squared equals a hypotenuse squared. But it doesn't. In front of the delta T squared is a minus sign. Let me repeat that. A space-time distance, spatially, delta X squared plus delta Y squared plus delta Z squared, everything's copacetic. But as soon as you have to deal with delta T squared, you have to put a minus sign into the Pythagorean. So it's not really the Pythagorean theorem anymore. But it is a distance in space-time. And that is the, that simple equation alone with the minus sign in front of delta T squared is everything. That is the center of his theory of special theory of relativity. Everything comes from that. And so it's a, it's so when we say as much as possible, we try to treat time, and we try to put it into the Pythagorean theorem. It won't work exactly that way. It, it but it, it but if you put a minus sign in there in front of the delta t squared, yeah, it'll work. And that makes all the cool features of the theory of relativity um, active. That activates them all. All right, now mention this on, on Tuesday. We're going to do a, a graph, what we call a space-time graph or a space-time diagram. Uh, and just to remind you, um, in four dimensions, a position uh, 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 of an event in space-time, you would have to have the time and the x, y, and z coordinates. And in theoretical astrophysics, we usually put the time coordinate first, and then the three spatial coordinates after that. Other physicists use the three spatial coordinates first and then time in the fourth slot. It doesn't matter. You can do it either way. Similarly, the energy momentum vector, four-dimensional dynamical vector, uh, we usually put energy, and that's our topic for today, energy, and, and in the top slot, the first slot, first of four, um, and then PX, PY, and PZ are the three spatial components of the momentum. Now, just to remind you, to reinforce these three, X, Y, and Z, they obey the Pythagorean theorem the way Pythagoras set it up. And Pythagoras could calculate a distance of a hypotenuse in three dimensions. Okay? It's, it's not too hard. But with T in there, 
you can you can set up a universe uh, in which t is just another plus delta t squared, uh, but it, it, that universe, a universe with a Pythagorean theorem like that, doesn't uh, conform to our universe. Our universe, you have to have a minus sign in front of it. Similarly, over here, if you calculate the magnitude of the energy momentum of something that's moving, you have to put a minus sign in front of the E. It's really weird. So E equals MC squared, Ashley. That's up here. And we're going to be talking about some other things today that go up here in this slot. Kinetic energy and potential energy. It all goes up here. And when you square it, you've got to put a minus sign in front of it. Now, we're not going to be doing any of those, but uh, it is there. Now, go ahead and draw uh, a vertical and a horizontal axis. Label the horizontal axis x the way we usually do. But I want to make the vertical axis the time axis. So I'm going to suppress y and z. And I'm going to express only the x and the time, the t. Right, and the t is going to be on my vertical axis. But what I want to do is treat the time axis as closely as I can to the spatial x-axis. So I would like to have it measured in meters. And I can do that by saying, all right, I'm not going to write t. I'm going to write ct. For every event, I'm going to take the speed of light c. Oh, better make a note of that. c is the symbol for the speed of light. You know, in that famous formula, e equals mc squared. C is the speed of light. And the speed of light, you can look it up. It's 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. It's pretty fast. It takes 500 seconds for light to move from the sun to earth. Five, it's like 499 point something light seconds. Eight minutes and change. It's kind of cool. So the vertical axis, you can think of it like, you know, measuring a distance in light years, right? So that's going to be the CT axis. Right, so I'll put CT up here. And now I'm going to do something with the time. We're, we're going to basically make some graph paper here. And I'm going to make some graph paper in the uh, first quadrant, the northeast quadrant. And I'm going to first start with some... Lines horizontally, try to make them equally spaced above the x-axis and just run them up for a few, few levels. And if they're equally spaced, that means there's the same amount of C delta T between each of them. All right. And so that's like a graph piece of graph paper. You know, the same number of centimeters between each line or millimeters between each line or you know, however you're... Graph, you know, same number of, a same fraction of an inch between each line of graph paper. Okay, so, so if you draw in those, a few horizontal lines equally spaced, then you can say, yeah, C delta T is the same between them. Now, here's the interesting thing about it, this graph paper. We have a law of physics that works on each delta T line. On each line of that graph paper, we know something important. It's the impulse formula. You know, we know all about forces, Newton's third law, Newton's second law. And when you put both of those together, we know that in an interaction, delta P's are going to be equal but opposite direction. Now, directionality we have in this space-time diagram left and right. right. Negative X is leftward, positive X is rightward. Okay, that's good. And we have delta T, so that's good. So we know that if, if you think about space-time as sliced up horizontally in this diagram, uh, sliced up by delta T's, so successive. So this is like um, pages out of a history book, okay? You know, the first line is the history book of all the x-axis at that point in time. And then the next dashed line up is all the x-axis, everything that's happening on the x-axis at that point in time. Okay, so these are like leaves in a history book, pages in a history book. 
And F delta T equals delta P works perfectly fine on that. But now let's do another set of uh, graph paper lines. How about this? How about some verticals? Let's do a few equally spaced so that each delta x to the right, and I've, I've written four delta x's here, um, and I've made them the same size as my, delta, my c delta t's. So at least for me, mine are, are squares. And I did it really carefully this morning. All right, now that's a different slicing up or a different set of leaves. It's a different set of pages. These ones aren't equal time. These aren't pages of history. These are entire histories, but of one point. Right, so this is like a signal. This is like a time series. Everything on that line only... So, for instance, if this first line is uh, one meter, you know, x equals one meters, that line is, is the representation of everything that happens at one meter for all of time. Okay? Now, the question, logically speaking... We have this impulse formula that works nicely on the horizontal slices. Is there anything that will work nicely on the vertical slices? How does nature behave under this partition with delta x's equally spaced? Is there some law, f delta x, that's equal to some delta something that makes sense? Dynamically, is there some dynamical delta something that equals F delta X? I mean, because, you know, hopefully it does. I mean, if, 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 I, if Albert Einstein is right, there better be. Right? And it turns out, by God, there is. It's known as kinetic energy. F delta X for those vertical slices of a space-time diagram. Yep. There is a dynamical quantity. It's called kinetic energy. And on each, each time you move to the right, the same distance, delta x, you have an equal change in the kinetic energy if the force is constant. Now, the formula for kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared. And we're going to start working with uh, kinetic energy in free fall. And free fall is a great example. Good old Galileo. Boy, did he make the right decision. All 400 years ago. 400 years and change. Good old Professor Galileo. And so we're going to study free fall in terms of 1 half mv squared for a weight force downward. The formula uh, F delta X is known as the work. So we, we call... We give it the symbol capital W. Now, don't mess up and confuse that with capital W equals mg for the weight force. We, we sometimes use capital W for that as well. All right. I haven't done a lot of that this semester, but uh, frequently you do see capital W equals mg for the weight force instead of capital W equals F delta X for work. All right. So you have to read, as I always say, read carefully and look at the context to make sure you know what capital W is. Okay, so the change in the kinetic energy is known as the work, and that's F delta X. Kinetic energy. And this formula here, 1 half mv squared, uh, comes out of a bunch of calculus. Raise your hand if you've had calculus class. Bunch of you. Now, 1 half mv squared. Now compare that to mv. Derivatives and integrals back and forth. So there's calculus in this. We're not going to go into the calculus, but this is the result of the calculus. That the kinetic energy, and this is the quantity that if you're under equal force, like a weight force, and you budge one inch to the right, or in, in a free fall, one inch to the downward, or one inch upward, equal changes in 1 half mv squared. Now, if you do delta t's, that's the horizontal slices in the space-time graph, 
uh, equal delta t's gives you equal delta p's, right? But for, for but what we found is that f delta x equal f equal delta x equals um, equal byte sizes of kinetic energy. Now the metric unit of work is known as the joule. And I've heard guys from India that didn't learn English. Uh, in the ordinary manner, pronounce that jowl. But uh, most people call it the jewel. 1.0 kilogram meters squared per second squared. Basically, it's a mass times a velocity squared. All right, so, so if you have something, one kilogram of mass moving at one meter per second, you square the speed, that's one meter squared per second squared. And then it multiplies out to 0 0.5 kilogram meters squared per second squared. That's half a joule. All right. The momentum of this object would be one kilogram meter per second. But it's kinetic energy. It's got that factor one half in there, uh, so it comes out to one half of a joule. All right. Now the joule. Let me pause for questions. Okay. Yeah, velocity is, this is just a generic thing to show you, you know, how, uh, how the numbers work out, how the units work out. So simple, 1.0 of this and 1.0 of that. But, you know, you could have 2.7 meters per second in there, quantity squared, and you get, you know, and you'll be doing that in just a second. Uh, the joule is also known as a Newton meter, Nm. And that's because it's a force times a delta x. Force is a newton. Delta x is going to be a meter. Or delta y if you're in free fall. You know, a meter of free fall. And so the reason I bring this up is because sometimes, and you can make a side note for this, sometimes when you're doing a calculation on pencil and paper, you know, like on a test or homework or something, you want to have your energy expressed in kilogram meter squared per second squared because you might want to do some cancellation. Or, but on another problem, you might want uh, your energy in Newton meters so that you can do a simple cal cancellation. And sometimes all you need is joules. So you just leave it as joules. But you want to have facility and agility with all three of those, joules, Newton meter, and the most basic one, kilogram meter squared per second squared. Simply so that you can cancel stuff every, every once in a while. Now, there's another quantity that's important in interactions. Now, everything, anything that is moving has a kinetic energy, even if it's not interacting. But if you are interacting, there's another quantity that's important, and that's called potential energy. Now, I'm going to use the example of a baseball to show you why we call it potential energy. When a baseball rises on its way up to apogee, it loses kinetic energy. So if we define another form of energy, okay, K, K equals 1 half mv squared, that's good. Anything in motion has that. But if it's, if it's subject to a gravitational force, we can define another quantity as minus F delta X or in free fall minus F delta Y if the weight force is mg and that's the one that we call potential energy now here's the formula for it gravitational potential energy GPE is minus mg the weight force times delta Y All right so there's a minus sign, then there's the force, and then there's delta coordinate. In this case, delta y for the coordinate, and then mg for the force. And my wonderful students, make a note, that symbol g encodes the negative 9.8 meter per second squared. You must use a minus sign. You've got to be careful about it. Right? 
And you know, in a drop distance equation, eh, just use positive 9.8. But you know, for coordinates and stuff, and also here, you want to have a use the minus sign to symbolize downward. And the reason, Camille, is because my delta y is going to have a positive sign if it's if delta y is up. If I'm moving upward, delta y is positive. But if I'm moving downward, delta y is negative, and I got to be able to handle that. And so if I have to also have the direction, the negative downward direction of the weight force always expressed with its own minus sign. Little g is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. All right. Now, if we use work, change in kinetic energy, and minus mg delta y, the change in the potential energy, we can uh, model the ballistic arc as an exchange. Now, what that means is this. For instance, on the way up, the baseball loses speed. It loses speed, therefore it loses one-half mv squared. It loses kinetic energy. So every joule of kinetic energy that the baseball loses on the way up goes into potential energy. So that if you're if 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 that baseball, you know, rises, you know, if you hit a towering home run and it goes up into the upper deck and you catch it, all right, you're up there in the upper deck and you're right there at the edge, you know, you can look down and you know, you know, the people in the lower deck, you know, you've got that baseball and you've got it. And as soon as you let go of it, it'll, it'll transform back into downward kinetic energy. So you have potential uh, for motion. It's up there. It's stored in the, in the height, stored in the position that it's attained when you catch the ball. So every joule of kinetic energy lost goes into a joule of potential energy gained. Similarly, vice versa. Um, if you're on the way down, you lose potential energy. And it goes into... Kinetic energy, because on the way down, you're getting faster and faster. So your one-half mv squared is getting bigger and bigger. If there's no friction, so make a note here to yourself. It's not on the slide, but definitely make a note of it. If there's no friction, what kinetic energy loses, potential energy gains one for one. Exactly. If there's friction, you'll lose some energy to friction. You know, dissipate as heat. Just like the space shuttle, you know, coming in to uh, land, you know, it's got to dissipate an enormous amount of kinetic energy when it comes from orbit. And it has to land at like 200 miles an hour out there at Cape Kennedy or at the uh, Kennedy Space Center. Okay, so it's got a lot of kinetic energy on orbit. It's got to dissipate, and that's what the atmosphere does. And, and eventually, you know, the parachutes on the, on the, and the brakes when it gets to the runway. Okay. Now, that being the case, if there's no uh, heat dissipation by friction or air resistance, the total energy, the sum of kinetic and potential is a constant. And my wonderful student, this equation equals kinetic energy plus GPE. That's known as the conservation of total mechanical energy. The kinetic and the potential. Add them up, they always equal the same number of joules of total energy. Now, on the way up and on the way down, they're exchanging. You might have a little bit of kinetic and a lot of potential, or a lot of, uh, a lot of kinetic and a little bit of potential. But the numbers always add up. And to show you that, so, so make a note of that, E equals KE plus GPE, total, that's conservation of total mechanical energy. And that's kind of idealized without friction. But for many systems, it's pretty darn, it's, it's useful because it's really close to the, to the actual system, to the actual physics. You know, so a lot of times you can neglect friction. So let's talk about energy levels uh, in Earth's gravitational field. So um, mg delta y. All right. Here's our example. We'll just kind of work through couple easy and get your clicker ready because we got another clicker question multiple choice 
the mass of a two liter bottle of Mountain Dew, it's mostly water. Uh, that's going to be two kilograms. All right. And we're going to take it 10 meters up. So that's maybe a little bit taller than this room. Okay. 10 meters up and we're holding it. So it's kinetic energy. If we're holding it, it's kinetic energy is zero. So that's why I have a zero over here. At 10 meters high, if I'm holding it, kinetic energy is zero. But I got plenty of potential energy because as soon as I let go, down she goes. All right, so we're going to you know, get a lot of motion as it falls. But for, for this moment in time, potential energy is a max. Kinetic energy is a minimum, zero. All right. Now we're going to use the formula GPE equals minus mg delta y. So delta y, so for you to go up 10 meters, delta y is plus 10. Okay, you get a minus, and a, your your m is two two kilograms, and g is negative 9.8 meters per second squared, and your delta y is plus 10. So let's calculate quickly the GPE at position y equals 10.0 meters. And students, make a note to yourself as you're jotting this down. Potential energy is formally defined as the energy of position. Kinetic energy is the energy of motion. E equals mc squared is called the rest energy. Now, we're not going to work too much with rest energy. That's the mass of something that exists in something simply because it has mass. It's at rest. It still has energy. But for this one, 2 kilogram bottle of Mountain Dew at y equals 10, which number is correct? Twenty seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Come on. There we go. Good. One more person. All right. All right. Ah, oh, you did, guys did good. 196. It's it's m times g times uh, 10. Uh, m times g, 2 times 9.8. That's 19.6. Times 10 is 196. All right, so go ahead. Go back to your diagram and fill in 196. Okay. What's that? It's measured in nm's or joules. An nm, a newton meter, is the same as a joule. Now, you have the ke, zero. You have the gpe, 196. Now you know capital E, the total mechanical energy. And hey, you guys, that's the same value all the way down. Once you have it at one level, you could put ditto marks at any of the other altitude for total energy. Potential and the kinetic will change. But total energy, yep, it's 196 all the way down. And that allows you to calculate total mechanical energy, kinetic energy, and GPE at any level. GPE you could calculate, uh, it's mg delta y. You know, so m times g times 8. m times g times 6. Any altitude you want. And it's 196 all the way down. So just before impact, here's what you got. Kinetic energy is 196. GPE is zero. You've lost all your potential. You're just about to impact. You can't fall any further. You can't get any more kinetic energy. It's all kinetic. So that's maximum kinetic, minimum potential. Let me repeat that. At the bottom of the arc or at the bottom of the trajectory, Maximum kinetic, minimum potential. Top of the trajectory, 
all potential. Maximum potential energy way up there at 10 meters. Zero kinetic energy. Now, if I'd started with some upward motion or some downward motion, I could start, you know, I could easily start with kinetic energy up there at 10 meters. Uh, you know, 14 joules, a little bit of motion, no problem. But this example, we started with zero. Now, energy is 196 all the way down. Here's a table that I want you to, this is basically equivalent to that sketch that we were just looking at. And you're going to have some homework with this, a table like this. And basically, just fill in 196 all the way down here. I mean, as soon as you get it at any level, you know, we got it first at 10 meters up. And you can put ditto marks all the way down. Kinetic, kinetic energy is the energy of motion, but potential energy is the energy of position. So if I have a lift, list of positions, 9, 8, 7, whatever it happens to be, I can always calculate GPE. Now listen to what I'm telling you. If you have a position, you can calculate GPE. If you also know E, the difference of those two is kinetic. All right? Now, when you're doing homework nine, you're going to have a table like this. It'll be something different. It'll be a baseball or a basketball, I guess, 0.8 kilograms. And you'll be able to uh, calculate. Matter of fact, let's go back and mentally do a calculation here. Uh, let's figure out the potential energy. What's the potential energy at eight meters? One fifty six. Anybody got one fifty six point ocho? Raise your hand if you got one fifty six point eight. Okay, so go ahead in your table in your notes. Write down GPE equals one fifty six point eight, and then okay, want to get kinetic energy? You're not subtracting anything. At 8 meters, it's mg, it's minus mg delta y. Okay, so minus 2 times minus 9.8 times 8. This, okay. So it's positive 156 point, what was it, 156.8? All right. So now what's 196 minus 156.8? That's what, 30, 39.2? All right, so anybody verify that, 39.2? Okay, so 39, so pencil that in. Kinetic energy at 8 meters up, 39.2. 39.2 joules, 39.2 kilogram meters squared per second squared. Hey, you guys, you know the mass, right? Two kilograms. Could you figure out what V is? Yeah, you could. First get V squared, then square root that, and you got V. And so you know how fast it's moving downward. Ching! And you'll have some questions like that on the homework uh, for a basketball problem. Now, before we dismiss, I want to remind you, SI today, 1.30 to 2.20. Go if you can. Tomorrow, 11.30. I want you to read ahead into Chapter 5. And do as much as you can. Um, and then homework nine will activate either tonight or maybe tomorrow. It'll be due on Tuesday. You're dismissed. Come on up.